so I was I read through the micro architecture as the idea of Gothic theory and style uh, by Francois uh, Boucher. Um, and essentially the whole reading focuses on the term of micro of micro architecture. Um, and so where and so the, the, the term was first coined by <clears throat> um, by the author in 1976. Um, where micro architecture is now sort of more commonly used um, to denote a sort of more broad category of Western medieval monuments um, and objects whose sort of design incorporates more miniaturized architectural elements. Um, so from left to right, um, you know, you have spires, you have, you have the cupolas, the buttresses, um, and pinnacles also. Um, so micro architectural forms were um, back then most frequently applied to um, I guess more like church furniture um, so on the bottom you know you have the um, uh, uh, reliquaries um, you have a statue canopies um, the third image it was a little hard to find but I think that is the um, altar ciboria if I'm not mistaken the the um, the, the sort of um, like entrance, like can canopy thing, right? Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, and then on the right, you have um, the choir uh, screens. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, grafted onto the structures, um, um, micro architecture could sort of more aestheticize um, certain religious discourses, um, you know, provide uh, theatrical frameworks for programs um, of images or more or, or dramatize more the performance of, of rit ritual. So most of these architectural furnishings were often visually cal calibrated to evoke um, biblical buildings or monuments where um, the author um, Francois uh, Boucher gives the example of heavenly uh, Jerusalem. Um, and so something that um, in interesting that happened was that looking at micro architecture versus structure itself, um, so, and, you know, he describes that even the most literate people of the Middle Ages took architectural descriptions quite lightly and sort of just, um, I wouldn't say ign ignore them, but just pass them, um, where instead they were more fascinated by the, by the micro architecture itself, which, for example, you know, the, um, the, the reliquaries um, and other mem mementos um, in the building itself. Um, so there was this almost um, more religious way of experiencing microarchitecture rather than um, the full scale ar only architecture itself. So it said that to um, medieval church goers and pilgrims, um, sacred objects um, offered a more um, or infinitely more um, valid uh, transcendental um, uh, experience. Um, and, he, and he calls it like a vicarious identification um, rather than the cathedrals themselves, whose structural um, arrogance um, only a few could appreciate um, and even um, less would uh, comprehend. So um, in a strange way, these smaller objects are misjudged and could be neglected in a time where um, bluntly put size matters in a way, um, because from 1160s onwards, um, the construction of churches would no longer be separate from the drive um, of the cities um, with their ambition for or scale or, or height. Um, so where the cost of structures increased um, until the end of Gothic uh, gigantism around 1300. Um, so here I'm showing the example of, um, forgive the pronunciation, is Saint Etienne. Mm, Saint Etienne. Et Etienne. It means uh, Saint Stephen in French. I see. Um, so this was um, uh, in 10, 1060. Um, so from here on, the competition for high and structural daring um, was restricted to more identifiable, you know, mighty towers, which symbolize this almost um, holy power um, and civic pride. Um, but then it was around the mid 13th century where the discovery of less extravagant trend setting um, example um, developed into challenges the more modest project. So the writer gives an example um, on the left of St. Uh, Chapelle and uh, the Santa Maria um, de la Espina. Um, so this is where we start to see, um, and it's pretty obvious, I'm comparing the left to the, the right, you see more of an aesthetic voc uh, vocabulary 
um, in the world of you know uh, tomb stalls, uh, fonts, and just um, microarchitecture in general. Um, so according to Boucher, it was um, oops. Yeah, so according to Boucher, it was the over heightened emotional needs of the population um, and the need for new and inventive complexities that increased the market for small structures. And so working at a you know, much more smaller scale, um, this allowed architects to perform more sophisticated model experiments. Um, so fantasies that were, um, or just like more imaginative ideas um, that were beyond the capabilities of any builder were sort of now, po now possible because of the scale. Um, so there was this ability um, for, um, and he uses this term here called structural forgiveness. Um, so this brings me to sort of my next comparison of the poetic and the realizable building. Um, so the dilemma between the two is now almost resolved with microarchitecture. So poems that describe complex tombs, um, a domed star studded vault, um, and a grand cantilevered mirror. So the, the, these are also all books and poems on the, le on, on the left. Um, so, and he says that these are like verbal buildings um, and they, most of them sort of rest on slender supports, um, are made of precious polished materials and are covered with jewels and ornaments. Um, so since there's a lot of these fantasies uh, cannot be carried out to scale, structures became smaller and more gadgety. Um, so the author gives the example that, you know, this sort of anti-rational anti constructions became um, almost so extravagant that they could only be realized in a structurally forgiving realm um, of buildings whose extraordinarily daring elevations um, required much uh, smaller size. Um, so, oops. Um, so the complete, you know, two uh, uh, two tower church facades in the uh, baldachin of the Louvain uh, tabernacle indicates its um, true immensity and therefore resolves the dilemma between um, the poetic and the realizable building. Um, so, when Gothic theory had sort of stabilized by thirteen hundred. 100 um, AD, its simplicity um, in the combinations of um, squares, you know, triangles and polygons led to this uh, quick um, exhaustion of um, basic variations. So then more daring, but always logical um, design combinations were therefore invented um, and applied first to um, smaller structures, um, uh, microarchitecture, and then to vaulting. Um, so this is um, images of the base of a tabernacle by Le Leckler. Um, so I actually searched the definition for um, a tabernacle and it seems it's, it defines it as like a, as a meeting spot in a more of a religious way, but I'm not sure how that's translated to microarchitecture itself. Um, well, in a, uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a Christian church, a tabernacle is uh, often where they keep something precious, uh, namely the, um, the, um, the hosts for the sacrament, for communion. So it's the, the thing on top of the base is really a, a, a kind of box, a container. Okay. All right. Um, so um, microarchitecture, um, as stated, before is sort of being used as experiment, experimentation too. Um, but, and I think this is quite relevant to sort of like what we're going through now, um, uh, towards the end of the 13th century, we saw um, a lot of events. Um, for example, uh, he gives examples of the, of the collapse of, uh, of uh, Bouvet um, in 1284, mm -hmm. um, the Babylonian ex exile, of the uh, papacy um, and then the start of the Hundred Years' War um, in 1337, um, the catastrophic monetary devaluations of, uh, between 1285 and 1314, uh, which were followed by the failure of the Bardi and Peruzzi banks in 1345. And then of course, um, you have the Black Death, which was a uh, plague um, between 1347 and 1350. 
Um, so that brought a lot of reduction in major um, pat patronage. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, parish churches, civic projects, and more privately financed architectural environments um, became the source um, of revenue for the architect. Um, so the sort of reduced size was almost counterbalanced by the um, enrichment of details. Um, this sophisticated treatment of materials and more daring design. Um, and so because of their attractiveness and manageable cost, these small monuments quickly moved um, outdoors and into the city itself. Um, and so they would become um, innumerable um, uh, canted levered orioles, um, uh, boulder chains over memorials, fountains, wells, um, and they even said galleries for crossbow clubs. Um, so he also mentioned um, banisters, tracery, and small vault design, and it's stated by 1400 that these small commissions accounted for about 50% um, of output in northern workshops. Um, so in addition to these new crafts, um, the introduction of uh, double curves and branch work had started. So um, these were more uh, forest gothic um, and flamboyant Gothic as an organic um, abstraction, which represented this more anti-structural theme. Um, and so this is where we see the example of uh, what's called open work spires. Um, so you can find them, it says, um, most notably in, in Freiburg, uh, Cologne, and, v and Vienna. And these are seemingly so um, vulnerable that they had to be heavily reinforced by iron. Um, and this proves to be an excellent example of, you know, the expression of the inter intersection of, um, I guess, micro and macro architecture. Um, so they sort of reflect um, the spirit of um, contemporary tower um, uh, reliquaries. Um, and then the example um, on the left, which is the Custodia of Toledo Cathedral. Um, contracting in 1515. Um, and this re represents sort of as seen through the eyes, um, which see in, and uh, this is a quote, the visible world images of heavenly things. So one of the most stunning constructions dedicated to the um, apotheosis of Christ. Um, it says, uh, you know, the flyer, the, the flyer is the crown like dome the tabernacle around the risen savior, um, et cetera, a part of this sort of immensely sophisticated architectural entity. So um, if we view the buttress um, figurines as a man height, the structure would um, measure, you know, 300 feet in height. Um, so, and these are all the examples um, in the reading itself. And I thought this could be more um, of a discussion based thing where, you know, we, um, it's sort of hard sometimes to identify what each thing is. I'm not sure if it's the, you know, a lot of detail or it's just the bad quality of the image. Um, but sort of, you know, in light of, you know, all the examples and points um, that the author made, our micro -arch architecture can be seen as um, scale-less, um, anti-rational and sort of understood by all. So within such a small space, it has a potential to express systems of decoration, um, complexity, um, and daring. Um, it has this um, anti-structural elements that are still based of um, theoretical principles. Um, so to end with a quote from the text, talking about microarchitecture, um, it says, dazzling structural dexterity, intensely geometric compl complexity, um, and a hypnotic dissolution of the structure through light. Excellent. Yeah, you uh, you definitely um, got to the the heart of of this particular article by Boucher. Um, and uh, these examples are 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 wonderful. What do we make of them? What about uh, what what attributes of these? Uh, indicate structural daring? Um, I mean, for example, the thing that, um, just these examples here. So okay, can you see my 
my cursor or mm -hmm, sure yeah. um so you see this sort of it almost looks heavy um and extremely you know ornamental and then you get these sort of gaps here that you that you can see past and you, you can see through um that part of the of micro of micro architecture um and then here in this example you know you have such sort of what seems to be um, a light base and a heavy top. Um, so in terms of structural daring, I, I think mm -hmm. it had many more capabilities that we see more um, or that we can explore more on the computer, um, whereas their exploration was microarchitecture. Yeah, and <clears throat> the microarchitecture that we're seeing here would have been uh, oftentimes can be made of wood, uh, carved out of single blocks, not really built up of, of individual ashlar blocks as a real building would be. So they're, they're um, able to do things at this smaller scale that, that couldn't be done at uh, full architectural scale. Um, yeah, the top heaviness of that last example that, mm -hmm. that uh, you were just pointing to, I mean, a base uh, has very slender supports. Uh, we see about mid, mid height there, there's a kind of arches that land on nothing, right? So mm -hmm. sort of like a columnless arcade, um, uh, creating a great overhang. And then the superstructure on top being, of course, a combination of just a big top heavy mass. And then further up, again, not only just a slender tower on top, but the tower itself was made of even more slender um, elements. So it's that thing, if you just wanted to express um, a daring thing where if that were really made of individual pieces, you would not want to shift the base at all, mm -hmm. right? It would just, it, the whole thing uh, would just topple over. Um, yeah, it seems. The one on the, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, it seems like um, this, so this piece sort of is one with this piece here and then that the mm -hmm. sort of overextending overhang is like a, an, an add-on, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's it's almost it's like a sleeve that has been like put on on this structure here. Mm -hmm. And then what's great also about that image is the juxtaposition with the actual arcade behind it uh, or around it, um, and how, uh, in a sense, uh, by comparison, undaring it is. Those two mm -hmm. piers on either side of it, an arch that does not have a very great span. Of course, we don't see what it's holding up up above, um, but yeah, the uh, it's one thing to look at these buildings and try to think of what the desire of the builders uh, was and whether those desires were met or not met. And again, because we don't really have any historical documentation, it's not it's before the Renaissance. People are not writing about architecture yet. Um, it's really the microarchitecture that we can start to see what they probably would have liked to have done um, at the full building scale and just were not able to. Um, I like that you brought up the open work spires be, uh, having the tensile, the, the steel in it, because there, again, there's a desire for a slender thing that's dematerialized, um, uh, but for it to um, so statically support that load or resist wind, they have to start going to a uh, tensile structure. So that is, um, that is uh, sort of harkens to the article by Trachtenberg last week about um, Gothic as, you know, proposing it's, it's, it's renamed medieval modernism uh, because they were trying to do, uh, in a sense, the aesthetic becomes, um, driven by the, um, the technology. And, but they're trying to use stone in a way that it just can't really do until you start adding some sort of tensile um, structural elements. So here we do see a sort of, um, at this moment, these late Gothic buildings um, just prior to the Renaissance or in some, in some you know, depending on what you call the Renaissance, what you call the Gothic medieval period, there's overlap and we're sort of seeing a, a, um, a transition where steel is, uh, where iron is starting to be used and um, that stone just on its own 
uh, is having a hard time achieving some of the desires that we're seeing in the microarchitecture. Um, Are there any details of the the metalwork within in the uh, stone structures? Uh, you mean details that we can access, or yeah, yeah, in terms of drawings? Uh, well, uh, yeah. So in the late Gothic period, there there's there are no drawings from most of the Gothic period. In the late Gothic, we we do see a couple of elevations and things, but in terms of detail, uh, detailed design drawings, uh, no, we don't have anything like that. Most of these buildings have been reno renovated multiple times over the the nineteenth century there was a big boom in, in gothic renovation and so a lot of these buildings are actually quite well documented now uh, but of course what goes on deep inside of this the stone we don't know in terms of clamps and and um, any kind of steel that was being used inside so you have clamps in greek architecture roman architecture um, uh, helping out a little bit in terms of shifting of blocks and things like that but not really not re not really providing any kind of tensile um, support. So the, the, the metal that we're seeing in here, or that we saw with the example of St. Paul's, the Dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, that is using metal in a, in a, in a tensile way. Um, Are any of the things, the, the micro architecture examples made, I, I missed this, but was, were any of them made out of uh, an iron? Oh, sure. Yeah. And some are made out of gold. The, ta the uh, reliquaries are often made of precious metals. Uh, yeah. So, so with these photos that are from the article, they're black and white. It's, it's, um, it's hard to tell what the materials are, but like, <clears throat> like this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can imagine that a, a goldsmith uh, working architecturally can do all sorts of things, uh, not only in terms of the fact that um, it doesn't really have to support against gravity, but the fact that uh, it's so much more easy, uh, easily worked than, uh, than stone. And so these are architectural fantasies in a way that are, that are being rendered in a medium that, that is not necessarily architectural. And so just like some of the um, contemporary artists' uh, works that we've seen, the fantasy artwork also as a kind of expression of taking um, dematerialization of structure to a limit, these things can happen in, the, in, in mediums like this that, that uh, can't really happen at full scale. And what were the limitations of using, say, iron in, uh, a, what were the technological limitations of using iron in, in the large scale? Well, you know, the, the iron in the medieval period wasn't really um, uh, very uh, strong compared to today's steel. So um, I don't think there's a lot that went on in terms of experimentation. What's really interesting is the, uh, do you remember the iron chains in Amiens Cathedral? Uh, let me bring up an image of that. Sh uh, so that is, my yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen. So, um, yeah, so this is, if you recall this video, um, just, just a short version of the clip. So <clears throat> the f flying into the building like this does give a sense of the sort of dramatic vertiginousness of the structure. So I'm looking down and now we're looking up and we're seeing the crossing piers of Amiens Cathedral, which are greatly deflected. And um, there's a good chance that it would have collapsed if they hadn't put in these, um, these iron uh, chains, these long iron chains that anchored to the far uh, western, uh, uh, to the far frontispiece and uh, uh, transept walls and were then um, anchored into the piers themselves. So the, when you're there, when you go there today, you can still see these iron chains. So this this was not planned, right? This this is something that happened a couple of hundred years after the the uh, so-called completion of the cathedral. 
Um, and this is not the kind of iron you'd want to be building cantilevers with uh, or doing any kind of uh, heroic structures. Uh, so this is, and here we can see the modification where it's been, oh, sorry, it's been, um, uh, holes have been cut to create a channel to go to the, uh, to the far pier. So can you imagine these pins here uh, trying to, you know, hold up this, um, this building and how, uh, how scary that must be. Um, so, uh, yeah, this image that we saw um, at the beginning of the semester kind of indicates that, that people were aware of collapses, they were aware of the fragility, and we, we discussed how this is actually, quite, this rendering on Amiens Cathedral is quite um, accurate in terms of how these arches would fail. And so this is kind of like a microarchitecture also, isn't it? Where it's, it's uh, trying to describe something that at least this particular sculptor had some familiarity with the way that structures work. So this is the kind of collapse that people would have known about. Um, they would have seen such collapses. Um, Yeah, so today when we look at things at the architectural scale, and some of you may remember Sans Cathedral from our side-by-side -side comparison that people had to uh, figure out which, which slide was being uh, described to them. This is, um, this is how contemporary visitors experience these buildings as you know, sort of soaring and serene. Um, and then even today though we have, let's see, there have been uh, buildings in Christchurch, New Zealand and so forth that have collapsed uh, from earthquakes, so we see that, uh, but we also see these the deformation of these buildings. You know the the heroic um, structures that have to be added. So this is Beauvais Cathedral, which Alex mentioned collapsed, um, had a major collapse here, and interventions had to happen. Um, where you can see that here, this used to be the 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 ar the span of this arcade arch was twice as big, and after the collapse, they added. Uh, the piers in between. So that was one intervention to keep it from collapsing again. This is a more modern intervention, these wooden trusses with, uh, with these uh, collars put around and then another truss going across here. And the thing is, we just don't know uh, if this is needed. There's just no way for us to, um, uh, to be able to calculate what's going on in here. So, um, And as we've discussed before, the big problem is this dematerialization of the walls uh, and the, the sort of very top heavy mass of the vaulted ceiling um, being supported by, by increasingly um, narrow, slender structure. And it's the opposite of what we see in uh, Roman architecture where you've got more of the heaviness down below. Um, uh, you've got the heaviness kind of up above. And uh, in the simulation app, that's what the um, design goal of precarity is all about, where it's the weight of the stone up high. So it's the, the weight of each block times the height. If you really think of it that way, um, you know, the Gothic desire is very much um, about precariousness. So uh, just also continuing on the theme of microarchitecture, um, uh, uh, this screen is basically a bridge uh, where we have um, we have supports for these arches that are just hanging in midair, so a columnless arcade, and then it's repeated on the even more microarchitecture here. So these spires are um, these spires are. Uh, a kind of open work form an open work um, uh, structure here. And uh, so to be able to literally walk underneath this and thinking that this is stone. Now, uh, to Jonathan's question, I don't know if there's steel uh, holding this up. It, it's possible that it's somehow all masonry. It's probably got steel in there. This is a, this is a very late Gothic building. But the intention there 
is certainly manifested in microarchitecture and then sort of made architectural here. But of course, people just can't do it. At, builders just couldn't do it at the real architectural scale. But you get the sense from looking at something like this, if they could, they would um, have. And um, <clears throat> St. Teresa and Ecstasy by uh, Bernini, again, a very heavy stone uh, piece of sculpture with a, a very narrow base uh, and overhanging cloud formations and dangling foot. Again, this idea of suspension and of levitation is um, something that can be done at the scale of a sculpture, but not, not at um, a real architectural scale. And as we've also looked at uh, a sort of levitation of these canopies, again, with columnless arcades above um, sacred figures, whereas the profane figure is bearing the weight of the, of the thing on its back. And yeah, so this idea of, of a fear of buildings collapsing uh, is not only represented sculpturally and in painting, but also in, um, uh, in uh, written text. So as we discussed when we did uh, the reading with Procopius, uh, in his panegyric, one of the things he said was that the dome is um, suspended apparently by nothing, much to the peril of all those beneath. And so the idea of peril as a sublime, fear as a sublime uh, generator is something that uh, seems to be thematic uh, and even desired uh, in terms of what the patrons of these buildings were, were looking for. Um, yeah, so isn't this the really the central problem of Gothic? It's doing everything that could be done um, before the modern movement, before you start getting um, industrial production of high quality steel. Uh, their desire is almost a kind of modern desire. Um, and uh, they certainly by the late Gothic, it's taken to an extreme. Um, and this extreme, of course, we, we see with all of these collapses and certainly the ruins of the churches in Cyprus. <clears throat> and what we looked at with the shell fire at um, Soissons and Reims Cathedral, um, these desires are, you know, dangerous and um, have failed many times. And so here's the outside of Ove Cathedral with the, um, the tie rods to keep the these um, amazing, uh, daring buttresses from flapping in the wind. And do, are those tie rods needed? Are the interventions that we saw uh, inside the uh, choir of Bove needed? We just don't know. And so modern engineers have tried to come up with a way to talk about these structures. Um, and none of it seems to be that accurate in terms of uh, predictive quality. And so, as architectural historians, we're really sort of left without understanding um, what we can see what the builders' desires might have been, but we can't necessarily know what how they went about thinking about uh, making things taller, and at what point uh, are they um, just not structurally stable? Um, yeah. So anyway, so with the simulation, it's, it's kind of leading into the simulation work. Um, I think in some ways you guys just playing with the simulation app already have a better intuitive understanding of arched and vaulted uh, and domed masonry structure than perhaps even um, engineers working with finite element models. And so it's in a sense, it's kind of like microarchitecture, um, but but still as but even easier to make than a reliquary um, or a tabernacle. And not, the materials are not as expensive as, as gold. Uh, so we've got our digital blocks here. And uh, so to be able to go through an iterative design process, thinking about masonry uh, is something that the medieval builders uh, certainly did not have access to. Um, so if we look at the buildings that are on the ground, this is a, this is a uh, Mapping Gothic France project uh, that we worked on in the art history department. Um, and there's a couple of hundred cathedrals uh, with 
high-res photographs um, and um, um, uh, nodal images, 360 images, and so forth. And if we start thinking, we, what we talked about was Jean Bonny uh, uh, last week, uh, June presented um, Bonny's theory that rib vaulting was used here, uh, pointed arches were used in um, uh, North African Islamic architecture and migrating through Italy. And that's it's because they converged in France, that's why France sort of invented Gothic or medieval modernism. They had these two building elements of constructional um, and structural superiority of the ribs and the pointed arches coming together geographically and sort of and making Gothic and then it explodes and gets re-exported to other areas. So there's a lot of ways that we can sort of model and analyze this transformation, this evolution from um, more Roman-like or Romanesque architecture to what we think of as Gothic and its spread. And I think a lot of the, the um, historical analysis of, of Gothic, uh, that the, the dangerous desires of light and height and slender dematerialized structures was kind of a French thing and that it was exported relatively successfully to Germany, Spain, England, Netherlands, and so forth. Um, and that when you get to the Gothic in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, namely the buildings built by the Crusaders and the uh, kingdom uh, after the Crusaders were forced out of uh, the Levant, uh, they started building very sort of Gothic looking buildings in Cyprus. And these buildings are not uh, as, as, um, as, um, elegant as French models. Even though they may have had French masons there, they were a French dynasty, Latin dynasty in Cyprus. Um, the buildings are more muscular and uh, more squat to the ground. Um, sometimes as, uh, as elegantly decorated, not in these cases, this is a monastic church. This one would have been a little bit austere by intention, but we can see that certainly there's no elegance here. And so, the um, the historians of Cypriot Gothic architecture have talked about Cyprus as being um, provincial form of Gothic that's so far from the center of production uh, that you've got sort of ham-handed um, versions of Gothic. Uh, these are images from buildings uh, and showing a little bit where they are in terms of seismic hazard. This is more si this is less seismically hazard. This is more seismically haz hazard, and these are degrees of seismic hazard. And what's interesting is this becomes kind of a laboratory to see um, that the buildings that are in the eastern part of the island fared much better than the buildings in the western part. In fact, we have these are almost totally ruined. These are partially ruined, and so we might get a sense of the challenges that were being faced uh, by these builders to maybe present a different story than center and periphery from Paris, uh, from Ile-de-France, but um, that here we can see that the, um, the builders built this church, um, uh, the Church of St. Peter and Paul, and something happened. You can see that this wall has been replaced. Uh, these buttresses are almost certainly uh, newer than the original. Uh, and these might have come in different phases uh, and not a product of careful engineering analysis of what this building needs for static or dynamic loading in an earthquake, but just more a sense of fear. You know, how much mass they put here is more a, an idea of how afraid they are. So with, for example, with the simulation model, you can just go through different earthquake scenarios and keep uh, changing the parameters of how things are. But these guys had to do it on the ground um, as uh, buildings were uh, uh, deforming and collapsing. So here we see that this pier was originally a smaller diameter and uh, they, they widened the pier at uh, St. George of the Greeks in Famagusta. Uh, things like this gap here so that there's a lot of stresses around an opening during an earthquake and this keeps the lintel from cracking during a tremor. So a lot of inventive things happen, happening and just a lot of, we are just really scared of the next earthquake. And so we're just gonna 
put buttresses on buttresses. Uh, this is the the, um, the cathedral in Nicosia. Uh, and then some in interesting uh, things here. This is this sort of trapezoidal uh, buttresses are in plan. They're actually sort of hollow in the inside. So it's kind of like a corrugated um, buttressing of this wall. And this wall is fared uh, very well. There's definitely some deformation in the in the arches here, but uh, it has survived many earthquakes. So, as an evolutionary process, um, these buildings are subjected to um, different seismic zones, and so the builders and the people who are maintaining these buildings uh, are learning a lot, sort of as they go. Even though earthquakes are happening intermittently, uh, so. This is the uh, cathedral in Famagusta. Uh, some people think it's the church of, of um, St. Francis. Uh, it's not sure which it is, but anyways, ground plan is huge and there's nothing left of it. And really there's nothing left of these over here either. So, um, so here are the earthquakes in um, the Mediterranean. The red ones are in Cyprus, the yellow ones are in the Levant uh, through the medieval period. So you can see that, you know, there might be several decades go by and people are, what we actually see in the buildings is people started getting really daring again. Uh, and then the daring level of daring and construction goes down um, after a new series of earthquakes. So this heat map, uh, and this was uh, the kind of sort of uh, final thing I wanted to talk about in terms of, you know, why we would want to um, have earthquake in the simulation. Um, because the evolution of Gothic form, um, you know, whereas Jean Bonnet's theory is these, the, for, the, the forms come together, the components come together, they rise in Paris and then they're exported and the exports to Cyprus just lose a lot in translation because it's so far away. But if we really look at uh, where things are seismically active um, and think about the types of buildings that are where, well, certainly Cyprus is very seismically active. Um, and so we, th we have to, sort of think about these buildings as not static things that are glued together, like microarchitecture, but um, as kind of spring-loaded systems that have their own resonant frequencies. Uh, and the joints between these blocks, there's mortar, but the mortar doesn't really provide like, like an adhesive that keeps things together from splitting apart like this. So in this case, we made the arch a little bit taller and actually behaved a little bit better during the exact same earthquake. So it's not necessarily things that are taller or more um, susceptible to earthquake. It's just really about the form itself. So you really have to just play with different forms to understand the resonant frequencies while at the same time keeping an eye to aesthetics. And um, as We've been talking about the theme in this class, uh, you know, the generators of the sublime. Does something look more daring, but it's not really more daring? Does is something more daring, but it actually doesn't look more daring? Uh, the only way we can say is it more really more daring versus looks more daring is by testing it. Uh, so the builders in in the Eastern Mediterranean would have sort of understood intuitively, I think, that. Um, uh, the number of stories in a building makes a difference. How how big the wall openings are makes a difference in terms of seismic um, uh, uh, resistance. Um, things that are not symmetrical. So, so many Byzantine churches are bilaterally symmetrical. Then the Latins come in and try to build their long naves and these wobble during uh, ground movement. Flying buttresses do horribly uh, because they can wobble so much out of plane. And lintels uh, crack like crazy but the, still the Latin builders wanted to have their, um, their tympanums. They just, the Byzantine builders would, and Islamic builders would not have tympanums here like this. They'd either leave a, a grill, a wooden grill or, or, um, or, or um, uh, more open. And the Latin builders wanted to have their sculpted tympanums, which uh, ended up cracking the lentils a lot. So we see lots of cracked lentils in Cyprus. Um, this is the Cathedral Nicosia again, the one with uh, the cascading the buttresses on buttresses outside. Um, so yeah, they've put they've put tensile members here, wooden tie beams, uh, which are common in, in Islamic and Byzantine architecture, and the Latins just didn't want to do it. And they had you can see that they had larger clerestory windows up here, which have been reduced um, uh, quite significantly. So 
slowly but surely they evolved to be more like Islamic or Byzantine buildings, uh, but they sort of went kicking and screaming. So here we see Noyon Cathedral, um, Shaft Cathedral and the Cathedral of Nicosia. So the Cathedral of Nicosia is really almost as tall as Noyon in France. Um, and you've got um, um, Shaft is much bigger. And then when you get to Amiens and Beauvais, they go even taller. But there's also something here about the number of stories. If you have a, just one more story above the, um, the aisle arcade level, uh, you've got sort of like a break point here and you might think of that this force with that lever uh, is less than when you go higher up and you've got, um, you've got more stories. And even where you've got the same height, but three distinct stories. So you've got a gallery on top of, a, of an aisle. Um, you still have this kind of vulnerable break point here. And so these two buildings, Noyon and uh, Nicosia are about the same size, but this has a less um, top heavy mass because uh, because it has a stronger base. So really you don't want a top heavy mass because the same ground shift uh, will be uh, harder on a building that has a, a more precarity, a mass, the same mass, but higher up because uh, the length of the lever is longer. So the buildings in Cyprus um, start out being a bit bigger uh, and then after 1350, when there's a huge earthquake, uh, the bases, the aisles, st proportionally seem to get um, greater to there. So there's kind of an evolution even in new construction. And if we look at um, this map, so here the yellow is two-story churches and the red is three or four-story churches. And so sure enough, the French cathedrals have you know, multiple stories and are very tall. Uh, but we see that in Italy, everything is two stories, <clears throat> even if the church is quite large, uh, like the Duomo in, in Florence, it's still two stories. And so you might say, okay, Gothic was exported to Germany, Spain, and England, uh, but you see the two stories are in the um, more seismically stable areas. When you start getting into the Wales Massif already, you start having some two-story buildings. And certainly uh, the, the grand Spanish Gothic cathedrals are all in this area, which is also pretty seismically stable. Um, uh, here in Lisbon, you can see, you know, terrible, terrible earthquake, uh, 1755 or so destroyed the city. So it doesn't mean that you can't have a taller or multi-story cathedral because some people will just keep trying and rebuilding and hope that something bad doesn't happen again. But here we see that the distribution of structural daring is not so much how far you are from Paris um, becoming more hand-handed and, and ground hugging and two stories. It's really, it's really um, mapped to seismic hazard. So it's interesting to think of buildings as being designed and many architectural historians will talk about this as an um, aesthetic thing that uh, the French loved light and the French liked skinny structures and, but maybe the desires as we see in the microarchitecture are kind of pervasive, but they're curtailed by seismic hazard. So yeah, the other desire of light. So that was height. We were talking about this desire of light. In Cyprus, you know, the windows are small and the ones that were large have been uh, largely uh, uh, filled in, which makes the building more seismically stable uh, resistant to seismic movement. Um, but historians have said, well, maybe the French loved light, but in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's just too much light. So they had to start, start pulling the shades down. Um, I don't know. We just don't know. No one's written about this from a contemporary time. We don't even know when this was filled in. It could have been filled in, you know, 30 years ago. But regardless of when it was filled in, it is more structurally sound for uh, an anti-seismic now. So then taking a look at um, the seismic map again. Here we've got three colors. Yellow is small windows. Orange is medium-sized Claire story windows. They almost fill the space or about half the space. And then red is uh, Claire story windows that pretty much span the whole space. So once again, we see that, okay, yep, the French love light, 
uh, and it translated well to England, Spain, and Germany. But uh, in Italy, the windows are smaller and they're almost always in the Claire story oculi, so, which are also very seismically uh, resistant. Uh, circles, uh, circular aperture in a wall is much better than anything with corners. And so we see a very interest, uh, similar pattern of small, of small windows um, in seismically active areas, medium size in transitional areas, and then red in uh, areas that are not seismically active. So <clears throat> It's, it's one thing for us to use the simulation model, try to get an intuitive sense of Gothic buildings um, for earthquake, but then we've also got this to think about. Um, these buildings were built before uh, cannons were invented. And uh, as we saw with World War I, many of the Gothic cathedrals had a terrible time with shell fire. Um, and, uh, but even the medieval buildings, this was these cannonballs are still stuck in the wall of um, of uh, St. George of the Greeks in Famagusta from Ottoman bombardment um, when they were um, uh, attacking, the, besieging the city. Uh, so we don't know if St. George of the Greeks uh, was destroyed from this bombardment or as all the other, the other 50 um, uh, Gothic buildings in Cyprus, uh, it was destroyed by successive earthquakes. Um, okay, so yeah, hopefully that gives an idea of the um, of of what we're thinking about here is to think like builders, designers of of Gothic buildings, dealing with struct with um, static forces, and then having to think. Well, the French probably didn't have to think much about earthquakes; they did have to think about wind. Uh, but the guys down here were being constantly reminded of tr from tremors and things, you know, 10, 20 years apart. You might be an apprentice in a Masonic school and never encounter an earthquake. And you don't believe it when, you're, uh, when your mentor says, oh, no, you got you to make those buttresses really, really fat. You might say, yeah, I don't know. Let's try making them thinner because you haven't specific experienced an earthquake. Also, the uh, French, uh, the, the, uh, French scholar in the um, uh, 18th century, uh, Camille Danlar, who did a, 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 a big monograph about the Cypriot churches, he, he was only there for two years. He never experienced an earthquake uh, while he was there. It was very seismically uh, inactive uh, around that, those decades. And so all of his, yeah, all of his theories about why Cypriot architecture couldn't quite match uh, French Gothic was a center periphery model. So, um, yeah, so why don't we, why don't we sort of uh, take matters into our own hands here and um, work through some of the simulations. So um, Okay, so we've got um, uh, ten, About half of you have submitted models so far. Is anybody having uh, trouble submitting a model. Uh, my uh, download's still not working. Okay, uh, is it is it um, same issue? Is it same issue that login? Huh? Has anyone else encountered that that issue that Peter's seen? I mean that Jack has seen. What's the issue? Uh, when um, I download the file for a Mac, um, it says uh, the file downloads is something called login, and then. Um, doesn't seem to load the program. But when you downloaded, um, does anybody else have the Mac version? I Did use, anybody download them? Yeah, I, this morning I uploaded yeah. one, I think, um, from my Mac and it was fine, uh -huh. but it was the, I guess the fourth version. I just downloaded the zip unzipped it and was able to open it. It should just be like a program, right? Yeah, okay. So Jack, I, I would assume it has something, can you download the PDFs from the, for the articles? Okay. Yeah, you might I'll try, try that too. A, I wonder, maybe it's just the I way. There's something with the download that you're doing, the way that yeah, it's. I'll, 
I'll try doing it through like Chrome or something that might work. Okay. And after this class, I'll try to, um, I'll put, uh, I'll put both versions, the windows and Mac on another server that on a AWS server that, and, and send out that link alternatively. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So, uh, in the application, <clears throat> you guys might have uh, noticed that there's this design goal pull down. So, and this is interesting to think about because we've talked about the desires that uh, seem to be apparent in the buildings themselves of height, of increasing height, or a sense of height with thinning structure. Um, a sense of precarity is certainly uh, evident in a lot of the microarchitecture where you've got top heavy, where things are. Um, uh, just in this particular structure, you know, where, where, where there's a greater mass up above. Um, and uh, that is not good for uh, when the ground starts shifting. So, um, and yet that particular, um, there's something about this that is different aesthetically and in terms of feeling a sublime than something like this. So. Oh, um, Rory, I don't think you're sharing the screen. Oh, okay, let me try to reshare. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, sorry, I thought you guys could see the, uh, the application here. Okay. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Uh, so can you guys see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah. So in terms of, of the aesthetics of this, so the, the, what the, the visitor's impression, uh, might be, um, let's say we're standing under this and we've, got something like this going on. This reminds me of in um, Osea Cathedral. Remember they had that cutaway for the clear story passage, which made the, the piers seem very small. So if you've got something like that and you're able to just get it to stand. Of course, now if I were a medieval builder and I did this, I'd probably have my head chopped off. Okay, so that has a completely different feel than this. And so we've also talked about how high it needs to be high enough. So in plan, we've got the same um, amount of floor area but we've got this great, great cost, increasing co cost for going higher and higher. And then are we trying to make it sort of more precarious, more top heavy? So yeah, so that's the thing about these design goals with height, precarity, span, and area. Now span is an interesting one because span talks to utility, right? In terms of a larger congregation in the church or a building. Um, pointed arch doesn't use that much more stone, a little bit more stone. So, you know, we, the difference here is from 253 tons of stone, 254 tons of stone 
and not being stable, we just add a little bit more stone. But of course, we have to have the technology of how to cut the wedge shaped blocks uh, where the center of the circle is eccentric to the center of the arch. And so the, the client says, well, no, it's going to be a greater span, but we're starting to run out of our stone budget. So we have to start thinning things out a little bit to use the same, uh, to be within our stone budget. And then there is still the height thing. Now that as we go higher with that same span, we have a sort of lever here. So the exact same horizontal force generated by the arch is going to be more um, destructive than if that same horizontal force has a, a lower lever to go here. So that's the thing. Does the does the the bishop say is our is our our patron our client? In the case of Beauvais, the bishop really 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 was desperate, and this much we do know from historical documents for the tallest um, cathedral ever built, and so the span has to give. So the span of Beauvais Cathedral is not, not that great compared to say Sens Cathedral. Uh, but if you really want to go for height, then you've got to reduce the span. So looking at um, uh, some of the, the uh, models that have been submitted so far. Uh, so for height, we've got Jonathan. Pretty dramatic uh, lead in there, Jonathan. I think it must have something to do with the how how uh, small that is and how pointy that is. The keystone. So this is just one big keystone here, which is pretty cool. Um, and so Jonathan has a height of 208 meters. Um, Chen Yan was going for height as well, two. And. <laughs> Yajin was going for height 56. So for the people competing for the tallest structure, you might say um, that, uh, OK, these guys didn't do uh, quite as well because they're in the 50s, 60s. Um, and maybe Jonathan won the, the race for <laughs> The race for height. However, it's no earthquake. How it does. Okay. Uh, no, you got to test it with your earthquake. Hey, it survived. Okay, so it totally, it totally works. No way. And then, <laughs> and then uh, so Chen Yan, let's see. Ah, oh, okay, so not as, as tall and more precarious for that particular earthquake. Okay, so Yashin. Looks like it's gonna make it. All right, so interesting. So this particular structure is just hanging in there. Didn't quite make it, but um, so the height is 56.5 and the precarity is quite high at 32,000. So the, the precarity is the weight of each block times its height above the ground summed up with all of that. And so that, that generates the precarity score. So Jonathan has a higher precarity as well. Um, but where Jonathan's doesn't compete so well and not that he was trying to is on span. So um, 1.4 meter span, 5.3, 5.5. Um, yeah. OK, so but in the race for height, I think it's um, I think Jonathan kind of took it with that incredibly daring structure. Now, the thing about testing with earthquake is 
the amplitude in terms of the of the the, the furthest that the ground moves is um, is is one attribute. The frequency is another. So it might have a, a small amplitude, but be shaking very quickly. And Okay, so this is a high, a fairly high frequency and a very low amplitude. All right, so uh, let's take a look at, um, and of course, duration is another factor. So the the longer that it's going on and shaking. So I've got this right now in a linear dampening means that the ground shifting starts out strong and keeps going smaller and smaller until it's zero. But when you have a higher duration, then it's gonna go, um, it's gonna just do that much more damage to the structure. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at span. So, so Jin has, has generated this uh, span of 35.5 meters. And uh, Alex also went for span. He's got 37.6. Okay, so it's just Sojin versus Alex. So who, who can make their respective cities prouder for the greatest span church? Uh, and Oops, sorry. Okay, so that was Alex's. <clears throat> Let's try Sojin's. So kind of similar. Now, uh, Sojin, I think when you made this uh, it probably was a taller structure. And then when you brought it down, the, the size of the coursing was still big. And that, that was an earlier version. I think last night's version was still doing that. And then I added a fix in the first version released today, I believe, so that when you um, make it smaller, it tries to also reduce the, the coursing size. So, but that's still an interesting thing too, to think of these very large, these very long uh, ussoir. Um, Okay, so at, there's, at some point there's an earthquake that one of these would probably stand and the other one wouldn't. And also right now the earthquakes are always shaking the ground, you know, exactly uh, this way in, in plane of the structure. Okay, so, so Jim's uh, stood and Alex's. But the earthquake could also, depending on where the epicenter of the earthquake is, the horizontal ground movement could be going this way, um, which would have a totally different behavior. So there's so much variation uh, just in the test of, of, of the quakes. And when the medieval builder would build these buildings or the ancient builder, there'd be no telling uh, when that building would be put to what test. And so, in the case of Hagia Sophia, uh, this very, very dome, uh, very um, uh, experimental dome, very high up with a, with a great span with tons and tons of buttressings. The Byzantines, one of their solutions was they weren't worried so much about light and dematerializations of walls, they just buttressed everything. But then the, uh, it was too much and it hit an earthquake that was just too much for it. Um, yeah, so span is certainly a precarious thing to, to think about, um, but certainly gives you in the building the most uh, floor area for, um, uh, for uh, activities. 
So, uh, okay, it seems like we've got four people who went for precarity. So, um, forty thousand. Edward, ten thousand. Eduardo, ten thousand. Uh, Gabriel, twenty thousand, and Yulin. Okay, so which of these? is uh, the most sublime. We should add a person here to, to, to give a good sense of scale. Um, So are the ones with the greater precarious uh, precarity level more sublime? What do you guys think? I mean, I, I think so, yeah. But the, so, the, uh, yeah. But the difference between the 40,000 one and the 10,000 one, I think in terms of sublime is not that different, but. Okay, so uh, Ijuan's is the 40,000 and Eduardo mm -hmm. is also sublime. I agree, I think, I think this is, you know, it's funny, it's this little notch here that does it. Mm -hmm. Without a lot of great height, there's something about this. Now let's say we are this tall. So this this um, overhang, this cantilever, with all this weight on top. And if it goes higher, is it is it more sublime? I think the, the heavier the top gets, the almost the more sublime it is, right? I'm finding it hard yeah, to see it, it as sublime because it's since it's in a virtual sort of like our perspective is is kind of unrealistic in a way. And it, it's since you're not in it. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's it's a sort of abstract just sort of tectonic thing, but uh, it's, I feel like maybe being supply also has something to do with being well proportioned instead of just like looking unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Well, 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 well proportioned. Uh, how do we, how could we qualify that? How could we sort of what would be the, the characteristics of well proportioned? Um, it's because you might say you might say this is there's proportioning, there's sort of different things that you could do in terms of the 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 um, the you know the various uh, relative sizes <clears throat> and scales of things that with aesthetically many of them can be beautiful. So is a, is a well proportioned a beautiful thing or a ability to generate a little bit more of a sensation of fear of peril? Um, I would say it's probably both. So it's staring in a way that it's aesthetically pleasant. That's my mm -hmm. understanding, right? My take. 
Mm -hmm. And then how much of that aesthetically pleasant <clears throat> might be um, um, personal preference for each, each viewer uh, versus kind of more a priori um, um, app apprehension of, you know, either the mathematical sublime with like, what, wow, what is that? How many blocks are in that? I, I, I'm having trouble sort of, and to also, yeah, to the point of that this is an abstract thing, we still can have some mathematical sublime kick in with trying to, to apprehend uh, the sort of pieces of these uh, and how they repeat up through a very tall structure. Uh, but there's also a dynamic sublime in the sense of um, of engaging with is that you know like what is that is that gonna is that gonna fall on me but but it's but it's also like in classical architecture you sort of cannot come up with sorry yeah go ahead yeah you, you kind of cannot come up with an explanation of why things are proportioned in a certain way even though you could mathematically analyzing them but mm -hmm. um and i sort of believe that if you perceive something to be aesthetically pleasant, then it also means that um, subconsciously it works in a rational way for you and that's make it mm -hmm. to appear to be well proportioned. Mm -hmm. Because if you see something yeah. like this in reality, you would almost assume that it just would not stand. And mm -hmm. for me, that it's not pleasant to look at, even though it's really precarious, I guess. Ah, but it, as we as we learned with Kant, it doesn't have to be pleasant to be sublime. So sublime I mean, means it's you're sort of taken out of yourself. You're you you're you're become engaged with something outside of yourself, uh, and um, it's not necessarily pleasurable in the sense of um, just apprehending beauty. It's, it's pleasurable in the sense of I am now outside of myself. So there's that distinct, uh, distinction that, that Kant makes between um, uh, pleasure and sublime of apprehension of something, you know, like the example of the storm but you're safe in your armchair. So if you really think the building's going to fall on you, then that's not necessarily sublime, and that's just fear. But if it's standing, and let's say it stood for 200 years and you're at the base of it, you may not be literally afraid it's going to fall on you, but you can't help but to think of you're, you're fearful of it without being afraid. Anybody else? It, this um, this definition also it relates to that that reading that we had uh, about the giants, right? Um, that's right. So something that's something that's kind of huge, gargantuan, and somehow surreal. But I mean, if you if you have something that's that's huge and awful, like you 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 feel a sense of awe, but it's like a negative sense of awe you're saying it still can be sublime. Yeah, oh, definitely, most definitely, because yeah. It's oh, According, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, and and of course, if we recall in Dante, the giants are, it turns out that they're they're chained. So they're, you know, first there's that, that, um, that misconception of what they were. They were, they were towers at first. And then it turns out, as it gets closer, it's not towers, it's giants. But then there's this relief that the giants are changed and chained and can't hurt him. So it's it's that it's the, again it's that fear, uh, sort of fearful without literally being afraid. So so at first um, there was a uh, the author the narrator's afraid, but then um, that 
fear gets sort of downgraded to just a sort of fearfulness at the awesomeness of it of, of its size. In the case of buildings, that fear is is perhaps not present for us, say, in a when we're in a medieval building today, because we're we're so used to steel, you know, uh, heroic steel stadium ceilings and things like that. And we, we, maybe there's just a sort of built-in assumption that something that's only 25, 30 meters wide is just not that going to be that dangerous and nothing to even consider. And then maybe then we're just looking at the um, the um, uh, the sort of serene, you know, qualities of light and material that are also add to uh, a sublime effect. But the fear part of it is not the structural daring, maybe not entering into it. But if you're in a world of stone only and you've seen collapses and you know it's heavy stone, there's no tensile supports. If you see enough of even these um, collapses in the simulation, um, then, and you know that all of the buildings that you encounter, all the monumental buildings that you encounter, excuse me, in the world are uh, made of this kind of fabric, then at some point your understanding of uh, of of the building would probably be different than ours today. So, uh, anybody want? Does anybody have any other models to submit? Lori, do you have my yeah. model? I tried to upload it, but I think it, I couldn't. Do you see mine, really? I don't see yours, no. No. Okay. Um, do you want to share your screen with us? Uh, yeah, let me check. OK. Um, can I just ask one thing that um, I, I was having issues with the Canon actually that it was facing the camera instead of uh, yes yeah there, there's a bug there and the best way to avoid that bug is be far away from the structure when you go into Canon mode. Oh I see okay. I guess that's another thing we should try is for the people who have uploaded or uh, is to try to um, Take a crack at shooting shooting them down. Yeah. Is it a screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why it's super tiny. I see. Yeah. So I guess the. Your screen resolution is such that uh, the, yeah, uh, um, the libraries are being cut off. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, that's not that interesting, <laughs> but I mean, uh, I think this is the the target is uh, area. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a, a balanced mm -hmm. span and the height, and then mostly have the person, the quake. I don't know how good it is. <laughs> Let's try that. As long as it's not falling on us, we're happy. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, so um, you might yeah. say, hey, that survived the quake. Maybe I'll just try to <laughs> increase the area a little bit. Yeah. Not that crazy as Jonathan's, but I uh, just made like a tower like 75 meters. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope it's alive. <laughs> yeah, just there. Nice, good. <laughs> uh, so actually, yeah, so uh, anybody else have it? Maybe you couldn't upload it to the server, but you want to share it? 
Um, so yeah, the, the simulation could be improved by, of course, having more elaborate structures um, that, but even just a simple arch, we can get quite an understanding of the kinds of things that uh, ancient med med medieval builders were dealing with. Um, and uh, yeah, it's interesting to, you know, so you get used to the simulation, but then it's interesting to reflect on how um, builders were taking great chances by lofting these buildings and then pulling the centering framework out and seeing if the, the arch was gonna stand or not. So here we can just do that very quickly. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's uh, um, I, my guess is that their greatest concern was, will it just stand when you pull the centering away? So for us, we just let go of a, of a handle and we just see right away if it's gonna, if it's gonna collapse. But the, uh, you know, it's, it is curious to think of how much did they think about, okay, I can't make this thing as tall as my patron would like or as wide, but I wanna make sure that it doesn't collapse 50 years from now during during an earthquake. So, you know, it's, if you think of what we were seeing with the, the uh, example of microarchitecture that Alex was showing us, the desire to do that kind of dematerialized structure with a, a sense of sort of top heavy uh, vaulting or spires and the reality of trying to build it in stone and just not really knowing if it's going to work until you let the um, you let the scaffold scaffolding go. Uh, and if you recall, in the case of Hagia Sophia, um, uh, Anthemius of Tralles was was worried. He goes to Justinian. He's worried that the um, the arches are starting to deform, and we're not sure exactly which arches are being talked about in Procopius's text. But uh, and then Justinian solves the problem for them. By saying, "Oh, you need you need more buttressing, or uh, wait longer before you pull the centering out." Or, but there is that moment where you could tell they pulled the centering out, and um, things started deforming and cracking. So, um, uh, yeah, that's just a uh, certainly in the case of Justinian, it, uh, Procopius is able to make him a, a hero who's gets the solution you know, from God and hands it to the, the architect. Um, but yeah, as you're working with the simulation app, just sort of think about that. You've, you're trying to push one of these design goals or maybe a couple of them at the same time. And you can't really necessarily just push it to your, you can't use all of your stone budget pushing it to that extreme that we were seeing in the microarchitecture. You have to pull back a little and make the buttressing a little wider, which means it's going to be not quite as high, and so forth. So, um, okay. So, for those of you who uh, who didn't submit anything, uh, maybe try to submit something by next week and um, send me an email if you're having trouble. We can take a, a look at them again for for a few minutes, and um, uh, because I think that. Working with simulation will help you with your final projects in terms of uh, look taking some piece of world architecture, uh, 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 ancient or medieval, and uh, being able to, to present it to us and describe what is it that appears to be structurally daring. Is is it generating some sort of a sublime effect in you? And um, and then we can all sort of pipe in and share things that we find uh structurally daring about it as well and so yeah remember to talk about things in terms of the slenderness of supports um the um span and uh overhang so those are sort of three crucial elements that we can talk about in terms of structural daring without going into engineering and um yeah, so as you're sort of just searching for images of buildings, uh, a lot of incredible uh, Indian temples and uh, Japanese shrines and so forth. I mean, just amazing things going on in terms of presenting structural daring. Um, and uh, 
yeah, so just just show us something that will kind of get us going on like, oh my gosh, that thing is really daring. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, All right. Well, you have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said it's just going to be kind of like a quick presentation of like a fly through of images and stuff to kind of just get a feel from everybody in the room. That's right. Once. That's right. It just to just to provoke uh, conversation and and ideas. Yeah. It's so. Uh, yeah. No. No historical analysis. It's really just a phenomenological um, uh, uh, sort of. Uh, consumption and way to think about uh, what what you're showing us, and um, and so each person should maybe take. Uh, so we'll I'll send out a list of of uh, who will go next week and probably just alphabetical uh, the following week, and so um, yeah, sort of maybe think about ten minutes or so of you know enough to, to kind of give us ten minutes of discussion uh, for each project. All right. Okay. So thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Alex. That was a great presentation. And um, yeah, and just continue to to work with the model. And I'll be I'll be watching to see more models show up in the uh, the server thing there, and see if anybody can come up with something just really like we haven't seen yet. I know it's a limited structure with limited parameters, but um, you guys, I know you guys are creative and can do it. Those design constraints, right? Design in the play instinct. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.